Boozhu, Kinemagi and NA Ireland Indigenous Cos, and welcome to today's citizenship questions. Today's episode will feature questions six through ten. So welcome in today's episode where we're going through questions six through 10. Please stay tuned as there'll be a link at the end to be able to practice these questions. The purpose of these videos, again, are to help students come to a deeper understanding of their civic knowledge, civic rights, and civic responsibilities. So let's begin with what would be question six. What is one right or freedom from the First Amendment? Many of you know freedom of religion or freedom of speech, but it also includes freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and freedom of petition. Let's watch this little video clip on the topic. Ah, my favorite, the Bill of Rights. Today, we're gonna to be learning about the First Amendment. What is the First Amendment? The First Amendment was included in the first 10 amendments from the Bill of Rights. It was passed by Congress on September 25th, 1789. It was ratified December 15th, 1791. The First Amendment in the Bill of Rights contains five freedoms that Americans still treasure today. They are the freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. I wonder what the First Amendment actually says. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. In the midst of the second year of the American Revolutionary War in 1776, the Virginia colonial legislator passed a declaration of rights that included the sentence, the freedom of the press is one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty and can never be restrained but by evil governments. For the constitution to be ratified, nine of 13 states were required to approve it in state conventions. Hmm, what did the five freedoms of the first amendment provide? The freedom to petition maintains that individuals have the right to make their opinions known to elected officials. Oh, hi, Mr. President. The freedom of speech guarantees that individuals are free to express their opinions and their beliefs. Second President John Adams must have missed the memo because as president, he tried to criminalize speaking out or criticizing the government. You can't do that. Why? It's a violation of the First Amendment. But just remember though, just because you're given the right to express your beliefs and your opinions does not mean that there's not consequences for what you say. Monitor your words carefully. The freedom of assembly protects the right of individuals that they may form in groups peacefully. And you know what they say, stand for something or fall for anything. But just remember, just because you're given the freedom of assembly you need to remember that all assembly needs to be peaceful or you can expect severe consequences. The freedom of the press guarantees that people have the right to gather public information. People can criticize the government. <laughs> Try telling John Adams that. Author's purpose is easy as pie. What in the world am I talking about? Pie, P, persuade, I, inform, E, entertain. Sometimes radio, TV, books, movies, they all can do these things. Be aware of media bias. Hmm, what is media bias? Make sure you're aware of whether or not a media publication is trying to persuade you or change your mind, inform you or teach you new information based on facts or just entertaining you, just trying to make you laugh, make you cry, eh. In the country of Iran, the form of government that they have is known as the theocracy. Religion and government are not separate entities in that country. In the United States, you're guaranteed the freedom of religion. 
the government may not establish or create an official religion. You can worship how you choose. You'll have to excuse me while I get my church on. La 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 Thanks for watching. Hey, connect with us. Check us out on Teach. Our question number seven, how many amendments does the Constitution have? The answer to that question, 27. I know there's more than just the 10. They're the Bill of Rights, Bill of Rights. You know how you had that song in your head. Um, I do have a link here. If you click it, it will take you to this website, list of amendments to the United States Constitution facts for kids. This will give you an opportunity to see it with a little bit less of the old legal language and make it a little bit easier to understand. So I do encourage you to check it out. I do point out our 27th Amendment took 202 years to actually be ratified. It was proposed around the same time as the original Bill of Rights. So you can have first through the 10th and number 27. And then there are some other unratified amendments placed in here as well. Moving forward, number 27. All right, so our next question, what did the Declaration of Independence do? Well, the answer is explained our reasoning for severing our colonial ties with Great Britain. It's like a very long breakup letter. So let's check out the video from history. The Declaration of Independence for me is one of the best pieces of writing I've ever seen. It's a revolutionary document for a revolutionary statement. You cannot help but be stirred when you read those words. Thomas Jefferson's writing uh, is absolutely magnificent. And when he wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. That was the first time anybody had bothered to write that down. And then you turn the clock back and think of when he was writing, how young he was, what a statement it was given the history of the world at that point. And you feel the excitement of being on the cusp of something so profound that it's hard to put it into words. If you review our Declaration of Independence, it has those beautiful words about all men are created equal and governments are formed among men to represent the people. It was a good statement of what we were all about. And that's the only thing people remember about the Declaration of Independence, that it was about all men are created equal. But it's really a roughly a 28 count indictment against King George. And therefore, because of the, the way in which the, the British Crown treated us, we now declare that we are a free country. And we want to let you know why now. We're going to have a war. We're going to have a war. In 1776, you have the Continental Congress meeting in, uh, in Philadelphia, debating uh, a unified position for the colonies with respect to the hostilities that have already broken out. And the fundamental issue uh, between them is, are they fighting for their rights as Englishmen within the British Empire, uh, or are they going to fight uh, for independence? And they're seriously divided. People who are perfectly willing to re uh, resist the tyranny of the British government are not necessarily willing to strike for independence. But there's a groundswell in favor of it, I think in large measure because they recognize that having provoked the lion this far, uh, there's no going back. All of a sudden you have this group of people who are going, no, we're, we're not part of some great chain of being with the king at the top of it. We are free people. We, we can vote for who we want to have in charge. And we're not going to tolerate you telling us that we have some class status we have to be trapped in. It says, you know, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, meaning that Parliament in London, the king himself, uh, the courts cannot interfere and take away your rights because the state can't take power from us. It's a, even to this day, it's probably the most central difference between America and every other country in the world.
It goes well beyond what was needed in order to declare independence. It, it establishes a philosophical basis for a civil democracy in which all persons are guaranteed rights by virtue of their personhood. This political genius, not just in Jefferson, but in Adams and all the other people who collected here, they saw a new time for humankind, which is that we can be free and that we can make decisions for ourselves. Our next question, what are three rights in the Declaration of Independence? And those three are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So an L, an L, and a P. Each. So remember, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Now the next question, what is freedom of religion? The right to choose what religion to follow and to worship without interference. It is also the right to not follow any religion at all. We've talked about this during our class time as the idea of freedom religion has been around since our nation's founding, but not always in practice. We know that it was in my lifetime, and I'm not as old as I joke, that a number of Native American ceremonies were considered illegal. So, and that's only into the late 1970s. So it's pretty important to understand what freedom of religion is, but it's also important to understand that it's not always applied equally and we would be a better nation if it was. Freedom of religion. The First Amendment of the Constitution contains some of the most fundamental freedoms of our country, including freedoms of speech, press, protest, assembly, and last but not least, religion. Religious liberty is a fundamental component of our society, and the separation between church and state is what made the founding of America so revolutionary. Many, if not most colonists, came to the New World seeking religious tolerance and the freedom to worship as they chose. By the time of the American Revolution, there were many denominations and churches in the colonies competing with one another. The founders believed the only way to prevent the new nation from being torn apart by religious factions was to sever ties between the state and churches. The First Amendment was ratified in 1791. Freedom of religion as outlined in the First Amendment is split into two parts. The Establishment Clause, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, and the Free Exercise Clause, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Basically, this language guaranteed that the government would have no official religion, nor would it prevent anyone from practicing their own beliefs. The phrase separation of church and state wasn't actually included in the Bill of Rights or the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson used the phrase in an 1802 letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. Well, in 1971, the Supreme Court in Lemon v. Kurtzman created a three-pronged criteria to ensure government policies or acts do not violate religious freedoms. First, a policy cannot have a religious purpose. Second, it cannot end up promoting or favoring any set of religious beliefs. And third, it cannot overly involve the government with religion. So how does that translate into the real world? It's probably best exemplified in our public schools, where neither teachers nor students are allowed to lead a class in prayer, because that would mean the school is promoting a particular religion above others. Educators can teach about religion in the context of history, but can't preach its tenets or beliefs. Religious extracurricular activities can take place, but they must be organized and run by students and be held during non-school hours. The Founding Fathers, based on the experience of their ancestors and their own beliefs, managed to forge a government whose freedoms are as important today as they were then. And freedom of religion continues to be one of the most important liberties that makes America, America. Freedom of religion. We have now reached the conclusion of this episode. Note that I do not own the rights to any included video. They are found at these links below, many of which are on YouTube. The original posters are going to own the rights, not me.
Miigwech for viewing this episode. To practice, please visit this link. This link will also be posted within your Google Classroom so you can access it. It's good to practice as it'll keep it fresh in your mind when we get around to assessing it. It'll also make it more likely for you to remember it uh, going forward and out of fifth grade. So everyone have a minogijigad. Minwa, mama pee.